You're listening to Hashtag No Filter with Zach Peter. That's me, your naturally platinum blonde pop culture connoisseur. I'm the reality TV junkie, self-improvement addict, and host with only the hottest tea spilled fresh weekly. For more hot takes, go and give me a follow at Just Plain Zach. I always keep it funny and I always keep it cute. Or if you're like me and you want to stay up to date with the latest reality tea, go and give us a follow at No Filter with Zach on the Instagram. Or... You can always join our private Facebook group. The link is in the description below. I hope you are sipping on some fizzy housewives-inspired wine for yourself, packing a punch at 13% alcohol by volume, but less than a gram of sugar. It's my no-filter wine. I like to call it my housewives watching wine because it's the wine that I drink when I'm watching real housewives. Today, I've got out. I'm not going out tonight. I'm disengaging in honor of today's very special guest, who I know you're going to love. Because we're going to get into all the Salt Lake City tea. But stock up on some No Filter Wine at nofilterwine.com. Must be 21 or older to order. And please sip responsibly. It is a lightly fizzy, crisp, delicious white wine and rosé wine. Available in four fun designs. Specifically designed around some of the most iconic housewives moments. That are some of my personal favorites. And I know you'll recognize all of them. It's perfect for summer. Compact enough to like sneak into your pockets, throw into your purse, sneak into your Uber. Do the damn thing. Go live your best life. Have a, a hot girl summer with some No Filter Wine at NoFilterWine.com. Today's guest is a wife. She's a mom and an award-winning celebrity jewelry designer. And today, she's not disengaging. She may be known for her eyes, but she's here to bring some heat. Please welcome from the Real Housewives of Salt Lake City, Meredith Marks. Hi, I'm so happy to be here and engage with you. I love it. How are you? I saw you were just in Europe. The photos looked incredible. Yeah, and I'll be there for a little while longer because my Instagram is a little bit behind me. (laughs) You know, I actually was trying to take a vacation and disengage from social media a little bit. So um, I took a lot of pictures that are still going to get posted over this next week or so. So you'll see me there for a little while longer, even though I'm not physically there. <laughs> Love it. And we saw that uh, you just gave, you just gave Brooks a, a happy birthday shout out on Instagram as well. So happy belated to Brooks. Yes. Brooks and Chloe are both July babies, two weeks apart. Exactly. Oh, wow. So July is a big month in our family. That's for sure. So did you guys do joint birthdays when the kids were growing up? Uh, for some years we did and they loved it when they were younger and then they got to a point where they really didn't love that so much. <laughs> yeah. So it changed. But it was cute because we could have like a big party with, you know, all the kids from both grades and I don't know. I thought it was fun, but, and they did too for a while. <laughs> How's the jewelry collection doing? Uh, really well. I'm about to launch a new collection of pendants called Magnifique, and the center is a magnifying glass because as I turned 50 in December, I noticed that I'm having a little bit more difficulty reading a menu and some other things, so I can just have a pretty gem-encrusted magnifying glass on my neck, and it makes it very easy. Oh, well, I love that. That's well, I mean, I feel like when you go to a restaurant now, you kind of need like the print is always so small and the lighting so dim that you need a little. A little extra help. I think all of us could use a little extra help with the menus. <laughs> my eyes are terrible. My contacts and like I need glasses so bad since I was like a kid that listen, I'm always putting on the the light in the restaurant and trying to like zoom into the paper menu. It's a mess. I, I, I feel the struggle, Meredith. Um, you know, you need to get your magnificent pens <laughs> then. <laughs> yes. So now you obviously have a background in law and in business and in modeling, but like what ultimately led to this pivot into jewelry? Um, yeah. So I, um, a long time ago, wow, it's like decades ago now we can say uh, how time flies, right? I was um, in real estate development and I owned a health club in Chicago and um, I, my passion had always been in jewelry. It was just not something I ever really thought I could do. Um, I had started undergrad as a fine arts major and kind of quickly pivoted into the business side of things just because I thought it was much more practical. And uh, one morning I was mugged after I dropped my oldest son off at school. 
And it was, you know, on the 1400 block of Dearborn where nobody's worried, you think you're safe, you know, um, nine in the morning, whatever. And it was, it was kind of crazy because I was slammed down on the ground and the man was dragging me across the street by my handbag oh my because I wouldn't let go. Not because I meant to not let go, but like, you know, your instincts are protect your body. And right. so you go like this and yeah, muggers don't try to mug me. I'm not going to give it to you. <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, it was sort of this like traumatic experience where you, you know, every time we have something that is traumatic, we reevaluate, reassess everything. And I sort of made a decision that I really wasn't doing anything I wanted to be doing and that my passion was for jewelry. And um, we were in the height of a previous nasty recession, which um, I don't know. Are we technically in a recession yet? I know housing today was announced in a recession. I don't know if technically our economy has been yet, though. I think there are estimates that we're going into a recession. I don't think we have the technicals yet. But in any case, um, it was, you know, a while back and everyone you know, and I said, well, I'm going to go into the jewelry business. And everyone looked at me like I was the most insane human being on the face of this earth. You know, why would you go into you know, a luxury business in the height of the worst recession of any of our lifetimes, yeah. da, 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 da. And I said, because now is the time that I can, you know, and it's jewelry. It's a little different now, but at that time really did have fairly high barriers to entry. It was typically people who came out of businesses, out of families that had been in that business for many, many years. And it gave me an opportunity to get in. And so I started slowly and I had a little trunk shell and took it from there. So obviously we've seen the business really grow and thrive since you joined Bravo and Real Housewives of Salt Lake City. But do you feel like the being on reality TV, do you think it helped your business or do you think it has maybe hurt your business? Because I know other housewives have talked about how it's made them a bit more of a target. Margaret Joseph has been really open about like lawsuits that have come her way because people see her on television and they see her wealth. And right now it seems like suing housewives is like a common thing. We see them going through it pretty often. But do you feel like it's kind of given the business more exposure or are you a little more you know, reserved? It definitely gives more exposure. Um, what's interesting, though, is, you know, for there are so many talented jewelry designers out there. Most people connect with a brand for some reason. And in this case, the, the reason would be connecting with me. So, you know, it, it, it's a double edged sword. If people don't like you, they're going to shy away. If they do like you, they're going to, you know, want to support you and buy, assuming they're in that market. It's, you know, the, the fine jewelry market is not, it's a very, very specific market. Not everyone is a fine jewelry buyer. Um, you know, it's, it's definitely specific, but overall, I do think it's been very positive for my brand. Um, and, you know, just as importantly for me, it's been very positive for me to have a voice to talk about the causes that I care about, which is to me equally as important as my business. Those are really my two goals with anything on television. Has your strategy at all pivoted from since you joined Housewives? Obviously, we've had the first two seasons air now. Do you feel like the market's changed a little bit? Like, is it a bit more of like a less luxury consumer? Like, have you tried to like pivot in terms of like marketing or, you know, collections that you carry in the store? A little bit. Um, I still have, you know, all my collections. Magnifique is definitely not a pivot more towards the masses. It's definitely a higher price point it's about, you know most of these necklaces have about 14 to 17 carats and gemstones in them so that's definitely not a pivot in that direction but i have done i've done a couple of other collections like the cameron collection which is um enamel and uh, semi-precious gems you know to try to hit um a lower price point as well. I've not done a ton of that in jewelry. Um, I really do love fine jewelry. I love what I do and I don't really want to kind of sell out to, you know, accommodate the viewer, but we are um, going into a lot of different areas, you know, whether it's been the merch or whether it's been a variety of, you know, denims and, and sweaters and things like that. Um, I still have a coffee coming eventually. It's been quite a uh, journey on that. You know, it took a long time to secure 
anything from I wanted a predominantly women run farm. And that took a long time to secure. I secured it. And then that was in the height of last winter when everyone was terribly short staffed and I was too afraid to take it on. So now I'm waiting until January for the next batch that I can secure. So it's just it's an ongoing process. But, you know, we're building a full lifestyle brand. Everything in my world is tying back to engage and disengage. Engage is the coffee side, disengage is lavender, because that's where I found my Zen in the lavender fields last summer in Provence. So, you know, a lavender, we have lavender uh, bath products coming out, but that's a little ways down the road too. We're just starting on that, but all kinds of different lifestyle things. Well, I do know that we had um, one of our loyal Zach Packers here on the podcast went to your store recently, and she even sent us a little photo. Um, and she said that she had a she had a blast at the store. She did a little shopping. Her name is Trish, and she wanted me to let you know that you know it was one of the coolest shops in Park City that she went to. Thank you, Trish. I appreciate it. I appreciate the support. Do you give Brooks any business advice now that he has, you know, his own clothing collection that he's starting to to build upon? Does he come to you at all? Or is he kind of like, Mom, I've got this. I don't need advice because I feel like most times kids don't want their parents advice when it comes to anything. So Brooks, interestingly, he's very independent and very capable and doesn't need a ton of handholding. But he does occasionally, especially this past winter when everyone was having a lot of supply chain problems and things like that, he does come at those points for advice. He's not afraid to ask when he feels like he's a little bit in over his head. But he is like super independent. I mean, he he really is running that business entirely on his own. You know, he just occasionally will ask my opinion or maybe ask for source for something or you know something like that but he's he's quite independent he's doing great he just graduated from nyu in the spring so he's got to go full throttle ahead now it's time so you do have a law degree so i'm curious being that we see a lot more housewives kind of dragged into the press for lawsuits and obviously a lot of these are civil lawsuits right and so anybody can sue civilly for anything and when you have money and you're on television it's a lot easier to want to you know gain some exposure for your business or whatever by suing somebody that's on television but I'm curious what you like from your own like legal background perspective like what is a fine balance between dealing with you know some of these lawsuits that come up and also balancing being on television like how do you oftentimes I feel like fans are like oh why aren't they talking Talking about their lawsuits on the show you know like what is that fine balance do you think between opening up your life and also having to deal with giving exposure to people that may want to take advantage of you by suing you on a tv show well when you're dealing with with legal issues i mean everything between an, you know an attorney and a client is privileged and if you are talking to other people about that, particularly if you're talking on worldwide television about it, it no longer is privileged. So it, it's a very tricky boundary to work around for anybody on television to discuss that because once you open that door, you know, you can lose a lot of your, your rights and that's very problematic. So you have to be very, very careful. I mean, obviously, particularly more so with, with a criminal situation, but equally so in, in civil. I mean, you don't want to screw up your whole case because you want your fans to be happy that you've given them enough information. The information will always come out eventually. And sometimes people just have to wait. It's life. Well, I am curious. A lot of people did want to know what your reaction was, because obviously we know your co-star Jen Shaw recently pled guilty. What was your reaction to that? I mean, we've seen her very publicly, you know, proclaim her innocence up until recently. Yeah, I mean, surprise, you know, obviously I'm surprised. I think probably everybody's surprised. Yeah. I don't think anyone was expecting that. Now, I know you did take a little bit of heat because you posted on your Instagram story um, about everyone deserving their day in court and being innocent until proven guilty. Can you give us a little more context as to why you posted that? Yeah, it was just there were honestly, I had um, a post on my Instagram feed of a photo with me and Heather and Jen in it. And there were a lot of really vicious comments, yeah. you know, calling Jen a, a criminal and all these things. And 
that may be the case if you want to say that now, but you know, when someone hasn't pled guilty and they haven't had a trial, it's not up to me or anybody other than the jury in that case, yeah. because it was stated to be a jury trial, um, to make that determination. And so I just was kind of frustrated because I do have a law background yeah. and it, and to me it just felt like this is not what our law says. So let's make it clear what our law does say. No, I, I agree with you. I've taken heat on my show for what people see as defending certain housewives when lawsuits or things do come up. And I'm like, well, we kind of have to see how this all plays out. We have to see, you know, and we have to believe what they're telling us until it's proven otherwise in court. And people are like, oh, well, you're defending people that are, you know, whatever. And it's like, but this is the system that we have, you know, whether it's a judge making that decision or whether it's a jury making that decision, we have to let things play out. Absolutely. That's why we have a legal system. And that's why I've, anytime I have ever been asked to speculate on anyone's innocence or guilt, I always say it's not up to me. I'm not the jury. I'm not yeah. the judge. It's not my place in life to make that determination unless I'm, you know, put on that jury, which <laughs> let's hope I'm not doing jury duty anytime soon. <laughs> uh, I have jury duty next month. Um I actually can enjoy jury duty sometimes. Um, I get caught up in in it if it's a good case. Um, it's a good case, yeah. right? <laughs> have you um, have you spoken to Jen at all since she has pled? Um, not on like the phone. We've texted a little, but I have not had any conversations with her. I've I've been out of the country, and yeah, she's now been getting her oldest son settled at uh, medical school, and so I, I have not actually talked to her. Now, we did watch you lose your father last year, and that was something we saw on, you know, on, on the show and on social media. And, you know, that was really challenging for you as, as someone that's recently also gone through a tremendous loss in the past year. Like, I was able to relate to you on so many different levels, and I was even often frustrated sometimes kind of watching the show and seeing how there wasn't as much empathy as I would have liked to have seen shown to you during that time. How are you doing now in that grieving process? Yeah, I mean, that's the key word is process. Um, it is a process. It takes time. Um, you know, for me, like I said, last year after I we wrapped, I went and spent about a month in France and I kind of found my zen in the lavender fields. And, um, you know, I still get emotional when I think about losing my father. Um, it was really very trying because I didn't have any downtime. You know, I, he passed away on the night of our first day of filming and I took that next day off. And the day after you all saw me at the luncheon yeah. and that was my choice. I'm not, you know, nobody forced me, nobody right, pushed right, right. me. That was my own choice. It's a little bit of how I'm wired. I kind of try to power through everything and that just doesn't work in a grieving process, you know? So it was a really hard time for me um, with the loss and on top of it, you know, just everything else going on in our world and, you know, have, having all the labor shortages and business and that peak of my season during filming, during everything all at once. And um, it was rough, but, uh, you know, I definitely took time for myself after and I'm still working myself through it. You know, I, I, I hope that there will be a day where I can like kind of not get so emotional when I think about everything. But right now I'm, I'm on a positive trajectory. That's good. I know um, Lisa Rinna on Beverly Hills is going through the grieving process where we watched her lose her mother. I always think it's so challenging. I could never imagine filming a reality show while going through that grieving process. I know for myself, I kept kind of working one because I'm, I'm single and I had a, I have a house. I have to pro keep a roof over my head that I didn't really have the luxury of taking too much time off. But, you know, for me, it was sometimes working was helpful and sometimes working was challenging because I had to kind of just put on a smile, happy face and entertain people on the podcast. But with her, we can see her really kind of struggling and having some, you know, unresolved pain or anger that, that's coming up on the show this season. Um, and some fans aren't really giving her her a little grace do you feel like what was your emotional process filming the show and kind of having to deal with conflict around you while you were kind of dealing with your own inner conflict it was um 
really, really, really difficult because, um, you know, I don't think that everyone around me had the capacity to really understand what I was going through. Um, partially maybe because they haven't personally experienced loss. And I, I do think, you know, in all fairness, it is hard to relate to that when you haven't experienced it. Um, partially because I did have a lot of other family issues going on that were not my place to talk about. And so they didn't even know half of what was more than half of what was going on. Um, and so it was just, I had like, just like a dark cloud hovering around me the entire time. And I don't think anyone could really fully understand or relate to it. I think unless you've actually gone through it, I mean, and obviously circumstances are different, right? Because the world and life doesn't stop when you go through a major loss, right? Like all the other things still happen. You're still going to have problems at your business. You're still going to fight with your neighbor. You're still going to sit in traffic, like all these other little things that come up in just everyday life continue on while you're still trying to deal with this massive grief. I live in downtown LA. So I can see into some of the other apartment buildings. And I just remember in those moments where I would be like broken on the inside, just kind of looking out and seeing other people kind of just live their life. And I'm like, it's so weird to be going through such a tremendous pain and then just see everybody around me just kind of living their life still. It's just, and I remember there were moments where I like, you feel like you're going, I've, I felt like I was going crazy. And I felt like, you know, it was hard to get up out of bed every day. Um, and I just, you know, I always try to remind people on this show, I'm like, just have empathy for somebody that's going through the grieving process because you're not yourself. No, I definitely was not myself. And, um, you know, I, I, I agree with that. And it's it's hard when you're, go when you're in that and somebody's like, well, I didn't get my whatever on time. You're like, really? Like... Yeah. Really? You know, it's it's hard to have an understanding of the things that affect other people, but they're still all real things too, right, you know? Right, right. And so um, you have to try to find your levels of compassion in a different way, you yeah. know, and it's, it's challenging. And then, and just understand that not everybody can relate to your situation and you have to also have compassion for them knowing that they haven't been here before and they don't understand my position. So I can't judge them too harshly because I know one day they will be in this position and, you know, I hope they will understand it differently. Was there ever a point where you considered maybe stopping filming because maybe it was a little too much? I mean, Zion. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think there might be consensus that everyone in Zion might have had those thoughts going. <laughs> you know, um, that was definitely insane. You know, and that was it was just very very hurtful, and I just felt like a complete lack of compassion or understanding at any level because really, like I said, I never had any time to grieve. So that that little. Day, that Memorial Day was a very, very important thing to me emotionally and sort of like a, a sacred moment. And to have that just thrown in the garbage that way. And, and you know, it, it, that was just awful. So, yeah, I'd say Zion. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I was ready to be to disengage from the show after Zion, too. It was so wild. It was such a wild trip. Um, how important would you say, you know, a support system is to have at that time? And how, you know, well do you think you activated that support system around you? Yeah, I mean, I was fortunate that season two wasn't during season one. You know, I had yeah. Seth there for me and he was really, really great, um, you know, uh, thankfully, mo you did not see most of the time where literally I came home. Um, he had been out of town when my father passed away. And there, they, you saw a, just a clip of when I walked in and saw him for the first time since I lost my father. And uh, I was a complete raving mess. And, uh, you know, he was really very, very supportive. My children were unbelievably supportive everybody it, it, i don't know how i would have done it without you know yeah my family it was really a big deal a very big deal how long have you and seth been together now well we're coming up on anniversary number 26 wow 
Yes, and uh, what's today's date? In nine days. Wow. Well, happy early anniversary. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And now we've seen that, uh, as we saw on the show, that there were periods where you guys were together and periods where you were apart. What was that conversation like, you know, deciding that you kind of needed to take some space apart? Um, I that's mean, never- obviously oh. it worked out because you guys are still together. Yeah, oh, no. It, it, not only did it work out, it was obviously what we needed to do because we're like in an unbelievable place. Our marriage is the strongest it's ever been, um, which is saying a lot for people who've been together for 26 years. Um, but it's it's painful. It's hard. It's like no one wants to, you know, admit that it's not working. But um, sometimes you need a little bit of independence to work through things on your own so that you can make it work together. And, you know, we tried so hard to at least hold the appearance of our marriage together for our children for so long that when they left the house, it was just like everything was exploding at once. And had we been a little better at addressing the issues, really, truly addressing them at the, you know, at the time that they happened, we probably would not have been in the space we were in. But, you know, we we really wanted a happy home for our kids. You know, it was really important to us. Now, was the intention of always to come back together? Was it just like, we need space, but we know that, you know, at the end of this period apart, we're going to come back together? Or was it, you know, we thought that this was rearing the end and we need space apart to see if we even want to come back together? Both at different times. Both at different times. There are definitely times where we separated kind of thinking like we just need some time and space and time where we legitimately thought this is the beginning to the end. Um, You know, and it's just interesting, you know, everything kind of lined up in our favor. I mean, I always say I'm probably the only one on this planet who can say that, you know, the combination of reality TV and a uh, pandemic saved my marriage, you know, but that is really the truth. And had the pandemic happened a couple years earlier, probably would have destroyed my marriage. And so everything kind of aligned for us and, you know, the universe was in our favor, wishing us well. So it all worked out. But, you know, life is weird. You don't know which way it's going to go. How do you feel about your portrayal of your relationship and your marriage in that first season? Because obviously, you know, when the show was coming, it was talking about Salt Lake City and Mormonism and, you know, polyamory. Was that something that you feel like was like a, a part of your relationship that was exploited for the show? Or were you kind of comfortable being so honest about that? I mean... I guess like it took a minute for me to just even open up to begin with and understand the process of what I was even doing. You know, I think like, I think at least for me walking into the situation, almost a little bit shy at first, you know, like you know how to address things. You don't know what, but once, you know, once the band-aids ripped off and I was able to really talk, I felt like really good about it you know, and, and the process was really, really positive for Seth and I learning how to communicate better with each other and, and being able to sit back and watch, you know, some of that stuff unfold and see how we were communicating and the mistakes we made in our own relationship. It's really very interesting. And so it depends on how you choose to spin it for yourself. You know, for me, I, yes, of course, there are always going to be some negative moments. Like, like I said, I never need to relive Zion again. Like that is over and done. There's not a lot positive I can say about that experience, but for the most part, you can find a bright side through most experiences. And I think it's about how you look at it. And and to me, I try to learn from, you know, the process and try to be a better communicator because of it. I, you know, try to focus on, on, you know, communicating about the causes that are important to me and my business and learning how to be a better friend, a better wife, a better mother. So, you know, I'm not perfect. I'm far from it, but I'm trying to do better. So were there like rules or boundaries of like, okay, we're going to take some time apart, but we're, you know, like, was there any sort of like boundaries that were set for you guys individually, being that you were going to be apart, but you weren't technically divorcing yet? 
Yeah, I mean, we did have multiple separations over time. So um, different times had different sort of boundaries and it kind of just depended on, on where we were at. I mean, we definitely did have a point at which I think we both thought we were for sure getting a divorce. Um, and, you know, obviously your, your boundaries are not going to be much at that point because what's the point? Yeah. Uh, whereas when it's more of a, well, let's kind of separate because we need a little time and space to, you know, work through things in our own head and whatever else, that's very different. And you're going to have a lot more communication during that time, you know, whatever else. Whereas if there's a separation that you think is leading towards divorce, you're probably not really, I mean, at least in our case, we had times where we did not really communicate, you know? What would you say is that one big hurdle that kind of brought you back to the place that you're now in where your marriage is so strong? Communication. 100%. You what, know? what forged that communication to happen though, especially after it kind of got lost? Yeah. I mean, it was a combination of a really good marriage counselor. Like he's great. Um, and uh, I mean, reality television, <laughs> what can I tell you? <laughs> it sounds insane. I know, but it's just, it, it's, it's reality TV. It depends on how you embrace the process. And, you know, a lot of people see it as I'm just going to be the biggest personality and put everything out there, put everything out there, put everything out there. For me, it's a very introspective experience. And it's about me seeing who I am and, oh, well, I did that. Why did I do that? You know, and trying to understand why I do things the way I do and how I can do them better and how I commu can communicate better. So were you guys allowed to see other people during your separations? Yeah, we did. And during like dating those other people, was it like, was it with the intention of finding a new relationship or was it more of just like, I guess you can only speak to your experience, but like when you were going on dates with other men, was it because you were trying to see if you could find a spark with somebody else or was it really kind of just to keep company during the, I guess, grieving process of your relationship with Seth? It's a good question. You know, I never really thought that much about it. I think um, for me during that time, I was in a state of, of, a lot of pain and, uh, you know, a lot of um, sadness over just so many things, you know, about life, about my marriage, about, you know, just my family in general that I don't know that I had the clarity to even know, to be totally honest. I don't think I could have answered that then. And I'm not sure I can even answer it now. Well, being that it is so public, I would imagine that the kids would have some questions about it, too. What was their reaction to your choice to see other people? I mean, of course, they're not going to be happy about it. Yeah. You know, kids always want their parents together. That's sort of the nature of things. But I will say this, you know, they... Um, did when, when I, I think because for so long, they, I don't think they really understood how bad it really was between us because we really did try to give a very strong front for our kids when they were out of the house and were, you know, in our view, old enough to understand or whatever it was. And they saw how painful it was for both of us. Um, you know, they were very supportive of us doing whatever it was that we needed to find happiness. And if that meant staying together, great. And if that meant getting a divorce, they were at peace with it. They really were. I think we under utilize or we don't fully give kids credit for wanting their parents to be happy more than just wanting. And I think that goes to like how you're, you're raised, right? Are you raised to keep up an image and a facade or are you raised to prioritize, you know, love and family and happiness? And I think, you know, that's probably a testament to you and Seth raising your, your children to, you know, really prioritize on family and know that family is so much more than just a mom, a dad, kids, a dog and a white picket fence at the end of the day and keeping up with the Joneses. It's about, you know, making sure there's genuine love that sustains. Yeah. I mean, the thing is my children, I feel like they could have really grasped all this and understood it much earlier if I had been more open with them about it. 
And I hadn't been because of my own personal experience. You know, my parents divorced when I was six and I was absolutely devastated. You know, all I wanted was them to stay together. All I wanted was for them to remarry each other. And so from my own experience, I sort of imparted that onto them. And they were obviously quite a bit older and, you know, much more mature. And they had a much higher level of understanding than I did at six years old. And I didn't give them the credit for that, you know? So that was a very big mistake on my part, I think. Do you feel like, do they come to you at all for like relationship advice? Oh yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) And how do you, how do you navigate that? Do you trust them to kind of make their own decisions and kind of just guide them? Or do you give them really kind of straight out advice? I think it depends a lot on the situation. Um, You know, I like to give guidance and let people make their own decisions, except for when there's something that in my view is like super clear cut, in which case I will give a very strong opinion. But usually relationships are not terribly clear cut. There's usually a lot of bumps along the way. So, I mean, I'll give a soft opinion. You know, it's very unusual that I would give my children a real hard, strong opinion on their relationship. I'll usually give kind of a soft opinion, some guidance, pros and cons, here's the other side or whatever. But I I very rarely give a very, very strong opinion. Also, because at the end of the day, you know, if in fact you're like, oh, you need to break up now, that person's horrible or whatever else, and they decide to stay together, you know what happens there. We all know what happens there. They end up taking it out on you. They get mad at you. They're like, oh, you don't like my other half, you know, da, 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 da. And it puts like a little bit of damage in your relationship. So I think in general, whether it's friends or children, you have to be able to proceed a little cautiously when you're dealing with someone's relationship and giving advice. Yeah, because you never want them to blame you if something doesn't work out or, you know, you always want them to feel. And I just think when it comes to advice, you always want the receiver to feel empowered in the decision rather than thinking that you're dictating a decision for them. Because then if it ever goes south, they can always come back and, and put the blame on you. Right. When at the end of the day, we all have to be responsible for our own actions, unfortunately. Yes. (laughs) <laughs> Unfortunately. Um, okay, so we do have some questions that people sent in for you if you want to take a couple of those. Sure. Okay, let's see. Um, Diana D. Bautista wants to know who your favorite fashion designer is. Oh, my gosh. I don't think I can give just one. I've got a lot. Um I mean, of course, Brooks Marks, yeah. <laughs> you know, but he's he's – starting out strong uh we have a lot more coming that you'll see from him that i'm really excited about uh you know beyond just this new pride collection he has a lot of other new things coming out i can't i don't think it's my place to disclose but you'll find out uh for sure him and then like right now i'm super into courage hence my talk um but you know it's i love courage but that's like new that's like recent i mean i liked it a gazillion years ago and then they sort of faded out for a while um of course we all know i love christian cowan uh frederick anderson irena shabieva some of like the younger designers who you know i'm friends with uh sadly august getty just showed his last collection so i'm He's still one of my favorites, but he's not showing anymore and then you know we can get into some of the bigger i mean we know i love balma um I don't know. What else do I love? I love that Dior. Um, yeah, those are that's a good do group. You, do you still stand by your season two reunion look with the feathers? I know people gave you some heat for that look. Yeah, I mean, that look, you know, the construction didn't come out exactly like the design. Mm. Um, so um, unfortunately, it didn't come out exactly how we wanted it to. But say lovey. <laughs> say lovey. Um, Carrie Jack 2906 wants to know if you're still friends with Mary Cosby. Um, yes. I have not talked to Mary in a little while, but again, I've been out of the country for a couple months, so I haven't really talked to anybody. <laughs> um, but yes, I have texted with her and um, 
It's been a little while though. I have, I, I, like I said, I haven't really communicated with anyone, but when I talked to her shortly before I left, she sounded great. She's very happy and, you know, moving forward with life and doing well. Well, we know that Heather and Whitney went off to film Ultimate Girls Trip season three. Would you ever do an Ultimate Girls Trip? Or are you like, I don't know if I can join all these other crazy housewives on vacation? I mean, I think it would be pretty intense. Yeah. I have not watched it yet. So I do actually need to watch it to give a full answer on that. But I think probably because it's not very long, you know, it's yeah. not a long time. Like, I think it's, it's only like a week. Long. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure it's like, it's a lo- going to be, a, it's a love hate kind of thing. Like, I'm sure there are moments that are fabulous and fun. And I'm sure there are moments where you're, that are awful. But I, I think it's got to be pretty interesting to go in with this whole group, which, you know, maybe you kind of know some of the women from the other franchises, but you've definitely seen them and, you know, have hopefully studied them a little bit if you're going on a trip with them and know what you're getting into to some degree and then actually do that. I think it's probably pretty cool and interesting. I agree. I mean, it sounds like fun. I mean, it's only a week. How much damage can really happen in a week? Mm. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Couch Sipping wants to know if you have any other details that you got from the private investigator. Oh, so let's let's clear something up on that, because I feel like I've said this a hundred times, but for whatever reason, nobody gets it. I did not investigate any individual. It was actually I called it a private investigator. He was actually a cyber specialist. I used the wrong term. Um, And what his job was, was to take these threatening text messages and try to decipher where they came from. So, no, I really didn't. I didn't have anyone like investigated. It was trying to just find the source of these threatening messages that were being sent to my family. So, no, I I don't have much else I can tell you on that. It was really not as exciting as it seemed. (laughs) Uh, Ball Game Mama on Instagram wants to know how planned was the bathtub scene, your iconic bathtub scene? Well, you know, I love a bath. I mean, I love a bath. And that's why we're going to have some lavender bath products coming soon from Meredith Marks. Um, I spend as much time in the tub as I can. And for me, you know, sometimes where you have a situation like, you know, where you're finding something out that's really like, oh, my gosh, you know, anxiety provoking. I don't even know how to explain that moment because it was like just the mo- one of probably the most bizarre moment in my life. And, um, you know, to me, sitting in the tub and relaxing, like that was the best thing I could do to try to self-soothe a little bit. Did you believe the allegations when they first kind of came out? Because we saw the women in the sprinter van kind of reacting to it. And we saw Whitney kind of looking up certain terms and trying to, you know, figure out like what was going on, but like what was happening in your head? Because I think you and Mary, you're the only two reactions we didn't see in real time. Yeah. I mean, I didn't know what to believe. I just, it sounded like crazy. And, you know, at first you sort of were like, is this even real? You know, which I mean, Obviously, you see it all over the news at some point, so you know it's real, but it just, it feels totally surreal, you know, like, is this happening? And um, I just didn't even know what to, to think or to believe or what was going to happen or how this all unfolded, you know, it was wild, really wild. And remember, I'm also going through this whole grieving process. Right. And also dealing with, you know, some stuff that I sort of talked about a little bit at reunion with with my nephew and and some pretty significant, you know, mental health things that went on there. And um, so I I just have so many things coming at me from all directions. I I could barely even process what was going on with Jen. And that's why I said to her, I can't be your friend. It wasn't because... I did or didn't want to support her. I didn't even know. I couldn't even process what was happening to her because I could barely handle what I was dealing with in my own life, in my own world at that moment. And so I didn't know how to deal with it. I just had no capacity left. Now, as, you know, someone with a a formal law background, would you advise your client to stay on a reality show given like her circumstances? Like, is that something that you would think would 
maybe help kind of craft a narrative? I mean, I guess perhaps, but I just think it's very risky because if in fact, whether you are guilty or not, it is so easy to say something that could be spun to incriminate you. Right. And I just think it's kind of scary. I mean, I think it's really gutsy that she stayed on. I do. I, I don't think I could. I really don't think I could under those circumstances. I am curious what your thoughts are right now um, in Beverly Hills. Erica Jane, Erica Girardi is under fire for being that you have a a, a background in um, fine jewelry and in law. People are giving her some heat for a pair of diamond earrings that her husband gave her that we've now discovered were paid for from a client trust account from one of his clients. Um, And so now she's in the process of fighting to keep those earrings do you think, like, what is your take on the earrings? Because I know that's got the internet fired up about whether or not she should just give up the earrings or whether it's a legal strategy to hold on to as many assets as you can because you may have to liquidate them at some point. So as came up in reunion of season two as well, um, the snowflake necklace that Jen had gifted to us, which was, you know, obviously a very generous gift, but not at the level of those right, earrings that right. were even in that realm. Right. Um, I didn't know what was going on. And so, as I had mentioned, it went into custody of a lawyer so that if in fact, you know, it ended up that it belonged to the victims, then it would go where it needed to go. So my views are pretty clear, you know, if, if something is of significance, if, you know, if you're talking about someone buying you a sandwich, I wouldn't worry about <laughs> it. But, you know, if something of, of significant value has been purchased with funds that are from a victim, I, I do think it needs to go back for restitution. Do you envision you and your family staying on television for a long time? Or do you think this is kind of a moment that you'll uh, appreciate, but ultimately, you know, move on from at some point? I have no idea. You know? <laughs> Every um, every year I go in saying let's let's see what happens, <laughs> you know. Um, in my head, when I signed on for this, I kind of looked at it like you look at a, a trade show in business. I was like, okay, so if you're going to bother doing this, you kind of have to commit in your mind to you know three to five years, yeah. and so if you can possibly make it, you know, if you can't, you can't. But um, so that was kind of my view going in. And I don't know, we'll see how, you know, everything unfolds as long as I'm happy and I feel like it's positive for me and for my family. And, you know, I'm able to do things positive for the world around me, which in all honesty, that to me is the biggest part of being on a reality show is having a voice for the causes you believe in because, I've always been very passionate about the causes I believe in and I've I've just never been able to do anything with it. And having the ability to do that to me is like the best part of it. So as long as I feel like I'm getting that out of it, I'll probably stick with it for a little while. Well, I mean, yeah, I think it's like, you know, you having an entrepreneur mindset, it's like you have to look at the ROI. And I think in this case, the ROI is so much more than just the monetary benefit, but it's also the exposure for the business and the exposure for the causes that are important to you and your own peace of mind. I think that's probably one of the most important ones is if it's still giving you some peace of mind, you know, you can still enjoy the process of it. Yes. Well, I hope we get to see a lot more of you in the future. I love watching your family on Instagram, whether it's the TikToks that you guys do or it's seeing you on Bravo. I am definitely here for for your family and for you, Meredith. I'm such a huge fan. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Well, thank you so much, Meredith. I really appreciate it. Where can people go to shop your collection, support you in Brooks, and just kind of keep up with, with what's going on in your family? Yeah, so um, my website is meredithmarks.com. Brooks is brooksmarks.com. Um, we have our Instagram at meredithmarks, at shop meredithmarks, at brooksmarks, at shop brooksmarks, um, Twitter at meredithmarks. I don't know what brooks, I mean, at meredithmarks zero is my Twitter. Uh, I don't know brooks is Twitter or TikTok, but my TikTok's at meredithmarks. So it's real complicated. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll be sure to link everything in the description below. Thank you again so much, Meredith. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Talk to you soon. 
Thank you guys for listening to Hashtag No Filter with Zach Peter. That's me. Give Meredith a follow. Go show her and the fam some love and support. Give me a follow at Just Plain Zach if you want to keep up with me. If you don't care about me, but you just want that reality TV tea, then you can always follow at No Filter with Zach for all the latest dish. We also go live on the Instagram and on the YouTube every Tuesday for our book, our book club. It used to be Bravo Book Club, but now we've expanded beyond just Bravo Books. But so New Filter Book Club on Tuesdays. And then we do a little Thirsty Thursday news recaps on Thursday night. So get ready. Both are usually at 5.30 p.m. Pacific, 8.30 Eastern. Sometimes they're a couple minutes later because I run a little behind getting my notes together. But um, thank you guys so much for your love and for your support. If you want to stock up on some disengaging wine, you can go to nofilterwine.com. 13% alcohol by volume, less than a gram of sugar. So you'll get Liddy City, but you won't have that gnarly wine headache. Thank you again, Meredith. I love you and I appreciate all the, the insight and tea that you spilled. Thank you guys for all the love and the support. Get ready. Jenny McCarthy is on the show next week, and that's also going to be juicy. All right, guys. Love you. Mean it. Talk to you for Thursday Night Live. Bye.